Hello, everybody. Welcome to Virtual Thursdays, sometimes Fridays, to our literary series, sometimes every other week, sometimes three weeks in a row. Um, just follow the schedule um, because I'm extremely unpredictable these days. But um, we've got a great um, author, and he's authored 10 books, and um, we're going to have him read to us for a little bit, and then we're going to grill him with really, really difficult questions. Actually, there'll be a lot of softballs, but uh, let's uh, let me tell you a little bit something about um, Martin. Martin Ott is the author of ten books of fiction and poetry. His first two poetry collections won the De Nova and Sandine prizes. His work has appeared in more than three hundred magazines and twenty anthologies. A former, a there he is, a former uh, U.S. Army interrogator and longtime L.A. resident. Ott works as a communications professional. Develops for TV and film in between other writing pro projects. Um, you can find his blog right there. And also you can find all of his books, not necessarily on Amazon, but um, Amazon is usually good for putting all the books together in one spot, so. It is. And other books that they want to showcase for 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 profit, of course. Um, so with that, we're going to turn it over to Martin and uh, thanks for being here. Uh, yeah, Timothy, thanks for having me. And it, it was good to chat with you before um, we got on. So I'm going to talk today about uh, Shadow Dance. Um, and before I jump in, I'm going to jump into the first chapter. I just wanted to say a couple of reasons why this this book, you know, I think two things were, was driving me for this one. One, uh, I just, um, and Jerry's a veteran too. I, um, I was just thinking about the people I met in the military and how so many of them joined, of course, some of them for, you know, patriotism and other things, but in, in many more cases, it was from poverty or a, a need to have money. And in, in many other cases, it was people with troubled family lives or having issues with the drugs or really intense things in their life. And we're using the military as a way to reboot which I think our my main character is kind of at that flashpoint. Um, and the second thing is, is I hate to say it, 20 years, a whole generation in, in uh, wars and ending in Afghanistan. And I don't think we think enough about it. People came back, you know, with some real baggage, you know, some of it unseen, um, you know, whether it's from, uh, sort of uh, bullets or, or burn pits or micro fissures in the brain from explosions or PTSD, which my main character has uh, and carries with. So these are the two things that, you know, I, there was a time about five years ago or I was thinking I would stop writing with main characters who are from the, but from the military, but this book just made me write it. Um, anyway, sorry for the long preamble. Um, Shadow and Limbo, Chapter One. You're not invisible. You may think you've snuck away, dropped off the grid, kept it all on the down low. Don't fool yourself, though. You left a ripple of your presence wiggling in the intersection of darkness and light like a villain's gloved fingers. Sometimes people squint at you as you dart along the periphery. Whether you try to do the wrong thing or the right thing, you ping along the moral axes of yesterdays and tomorrows. Up until now, I've always counted myself with more rights than wrongs. And like everyone, I was followed by a shadow. Mine was barely the size of a dog. At first, I thought it was Pops who spun tall tales with a fluency not unlike a second language. Later, I kidded myself that it was the women looking to bed me. But it was something else, a fleeting passenger that hounded me as a boy and haunted me as a man. I joined the army the day I turned 18 and ordered the shadow to stay home. Strangely, it listened for a time. Losing itself in the sunset on the bayou, a dull fire shimmering in the eyes of everyone I left behind. There was no family to see me off, a story for another day, and my girlfriend Deirdre had told me I was a fucking idiot. Not that I blamed her for calling it like she saw it. Suffice to say that Private Buddy Rivette was looking to reinvent himself and had to get himself sent to a damn war in the process. No one ever told me I had a lick of sense, especially not my best friend Solomon St. James, one of my fellow latchkey kids whose parents had jobs on the Gambling River boat aces. Unlike Deirdre, he didn't think I was an asshat for not emailing while I was in Kabul. 
He knew I was intentionally difficult. Solomon mailed me letters from a string of small towns as he drifted from Lake Charles. He followed a progression of women westward, finding gigs as a DJ, enjoying his time on the road. I went the other direction. After spending so much time skirting the law in the company of my hoodlum parents and hoodlum friends, I needed order. I found it at a deserted Soviet base in Afghanistan, Bagram Airfield. My role there as military police was an impossible job. How do you help interrogate? How do you help interrogators stop a war in a place where conflict is the same as the sun rising and falling? It made me hate, well, everyone. The ghosts in my past were quieted by the ghosts from the air base. I paced my rounds in the spaces between sunset and sunrise. I became scary in my own right, like the ferryman on the river Styx, but there were no coins passed to me, no price for passage into the darkness. Anyone I transported to and from the interrogation rooms were, was doomed and they knew it. We all looked away when the sun went down, blinded by our fears. Now I was back in purgatory in a floating gas station in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. This is probably not a fair assessment of Tercera Island, one of nine in the Azores where the U.S. kept an Air Force base called Lajes Field. For nearly 60 years, soldiers passed through here to missions all over the world, some known, others hush-hush. As the troops in Afghanistan cycled out, the usage of Lajes was on the decline, at least until the U.S. invested in another war. Our C-17 transport plane was undergoing minor repairs after a trip from, from Manas, which had passed through Iceland. Jet lag didn't even begin to cover my feeling of being out of time and place. We'd been set up with temporary shelter for the night in an open room barracks. It was like a five-star hotel after becoming used to cots and rough living, used to explosions and broken sleep, used to having a rifle within arm's reach the way a mother sleeps next to her baby. It would be my first mattress in more than a year. I couldn't sleep though, and neither could my squad of MPs. We tried playing cards in the mid-afternoon sun boring through our windows, but somehow all of us were grumpy about the shifting fortunes in our hands. We ended up trading dollars for euros with a couple of off-duty airmen in the mostly empty lounge, changed clothes and wandered off base toward the signs for the nearest town. It was our final chance to stretch our legs after nearly a full day of flying. We marched single file with me trailing in the rear. Staff Sergeant Lasicki was on point and I made it a point to steer clear of him. The other MPs hated him as well, but he kept them all close in the way of a 1950s father, all commands and insults. Lasicki was a piece of work. In the space of a couple hours, he made our squad feel guilty enough to go along for this unauthorized trip while also making it clear that anyone getting out of line could be punished. This was next level manipulation from an military police officer used to operating in the shadows. The guys were filled with bravado as the sun lowered on our shoulders, telling each other which women were going to get the business when they got back to Louisiana. Uh, Rivette's boyfriend is gonna be jealous when he gets back after all the sweet loving he gave those prisoners. Jackass, I muttered under my breath every 10th step, counting to keep my cool, counting to keep myself from beating Lasiki within an inch of his life. The closer I came to landing in the States, something feral was stirred in me. Perhaps the reason I avoided leave during my tours. A voice inside of me whispered to turn back, but the story of my life was never turning back. I didn't want to be blinded by what might be there. The countryside quickly gave way to a packed seaside town of white houses with tan roofs. We soon found ourselves on narrow streets with wave patterns on the sidewalks matching the designs on white gates dividing intersections. The sea calligraphy felt like ruins, protection against primal forces. I wonder wondered if this included the U.S. military. We ended up on Hua de Jesus and ducked into one of the cafes. The establishment had no name, but featured an image above the door of a pig in a chef's hat on its two hind legs, holding a beer and winking toward the sidewalk. Plastic tables and chairs had been set up beneath temporary awnings flapping in the salty breeze wafting from the ocean. A few other servicemen from the brace were already drinking here. The locals, meanwhile, congregated inside at long wooden tables. A division existed between the islanders and soldiers in this Azores crossroad, situated somewhere between Portugal, the United States, and Sleepy Paradise. During orientation, we'd been warned that we couldn't wear uniforms outside Lajes Field. We all dressed in army-issued brown t-shirts and jeans, still a gang, even without the camouflage. I separated myself from the rest of the guys and sat at a small table, pushed against one of the open glass doors, I was past worrying what the other MPs thought about me. 
I wouldn't be pals with any of these fuckers after return to civilian life. I was a stickler for following rules, the tattletale for raising concerns to the company commander, the weirdo who likes spending time by myself. My closest friends had been the prisoners and of course my books, all of which had been left behind. Now, the only reading material I had was the most recent letter from Solomon. I'd looked at it enough on my final days that the folds were starting to fray, not unlike our equipment, our clothing, our sense of humor. The other ex-prison guards started chugging beer at a table near the entrance, loud and getting louder. I tried not to listen to them from my ta ta table straddling worlds. Solomon's cursive was still childish with lavish hooks and swoops. Yet there was a section of the letter I kept coming back to, a sign that everything wasn't okay. I'm hanging out with this married chick and she's messing with my mind. Her husband is my boss's brother and I'm in way too deep with the family. They're into some strange ass shit. I can't quit her or my job here at Club Paradise. I'm thinking about bolting, but the setup's sweet. Too bad you aren't here to set me straight. Um, I'm going to skip a uh, flashback and a memory right now in this chapter um, where uh, as teenagers, Buddy uh, intercedes on the behalf of Solomon, uh, I guess a self-proclaimed um, womanizer. He... Uh, who's having an affair with their math teacher, he he uh, points his bike at the truck of the woman's husband and ends up getting injured in the process. Um, that's the flashback scene. And now back to scene. I stared at the last two fingers of my left hand, still curved from the dislocation, clutching Solomon's letter. I'd always found comfort in meeting the scars the way others looked at tattoos. Each of them defined me in some ways. Walk away, witch, Lasiki belted out from across the courtyard. Some weird shit was going down. A thin woman in white shorts, a black sweater, and purple headscarf backed away from the table of MPs, speaking softly but quickly as though throwing a curse. She wasn't moving quickly enough for Lasiki. He tossed a half glass of beer at her face, and she raced for my table. I grabbed her hand in passing and stood up, wiping her dripping face with the tail of my shirt. I glanced over at the bar, but the waiters weren't coming outside. Lasiki challenged me with a stare. He wanted me to throw down. Waste of a good beer, he muttered. The woman looked at me as though I was a scientific curiosity, her scowl, scowl transforming into a smile. My free hand unclenched from a fist, and she held that one as well. I'm sorry about my friends, I said. Are they really your friends, she asked. No, guess not. Then don't apologize. Why did this idiot get mad at you, I asked. I read his palm and told him the truth, that he was going to be seriously injured and soon. He told me that he didn't survive a war only to have someone put a hex on him. The boys from my unit were all Louisiana born and bred with a heavy dis dislike for anything that smacked of black magic. I'm already cursed, try me, I suggested. The woman sighed as though she didn't want to discuss the future with someone she liked. She opened my right palm and stared at it for what seemed an eternity. A jagged scar cut across it from the truck accident where the bike's hand brake had sliced deep into my flexor tendon. The injury had left a blank spot in the middle of my palm where the lines disappeared. Your childhood is misery. That much I know, I said. Your love and fate line intersect in the future. You'll face decisions that could hurt you or the people you love. I can't help you with advice. You're living in that blank spot, that dead zone. Her voice unnerved me and I felt drunk even though I'd only sipped in my beer. Dead zone felt exactly right for the past few years of life. I emptied out my pocket and shoved my remaining euros in her hand, asking, what choice should I make? You can't save everyone. When the time comes, save yourself. Um, the chapter ends a little bit after that. But I, I think in some ways that is a working thesis for what Buddy is like as a person. He is carrying trauma from childhood, trauma from the military, and always uh, like with his friend Solomon is always stepping to try to save other people when he really uh, is getting in many ways more and more injured in the process. I don't wanna um, get too much in the plot of the book. He does go West and he does run afoul of this crime family, ends up working for them and then uh, is faced with a decision on can he save other people and what's the toll. Um, Sounds great, Martin. Uh, just uh, so I'm gonna there's some questions in chat that I will get to, but I just want to start with like um, the title. 
you know, shadow dance. And then right in the very beginning of what you read tonight, you talked about the whole living in the shadows. Did not do shadows appear throughout the book as a major metaphor, or do they just sort of appear in the preface or or the first chapter? You know, um, I, they do appear as some people, um, not me kind of labeled this noir or urban noir um, when they read the manuscript. Um, and I felt like it kind of went underground, you know, LA, bright lights, you know, Hollywood, and almost all of it is in seedy places and carrying that sort of lack of light. Um, my original title for it was Sunset Blinds, and but I thought the shadow dance, I just liked it a little bit better. And every chapter has shadow in the title and some variation of it. Great. And it's interesting to see that like the, the book cover is wonderful, but like the, the art on your wall and the, the frame and everything's all black and white in your house. Even do you think like, <laughs> do you think that adds some sort of influence? Is that what you're drawn to the dark and the light? Probably. I mean, there's other war, or, you know, sort of uh, things in my house with color, but, I, <laughs> uh, um, but, but, I've written a lot about LA and it doesn't, it tends to be the stuff that's in the nooks and crannies to be, to be fair. Um, a first question from Robert, you have 10 books. What is your inspiration to write? And what is the motivation to keep going? Um, short answer, a compulsion, long answer. Books were my first love. Uh, it, it, you know, I, I grew up with a couple of people here in a small town in Michigan and books were the first place. I envisioned a wider world and it, it, you know, they've always been there with me and I wanted to engage in that dialogue back. And, you know, probably at the age of 25 or 26, I've just been, you know, at it. And, you know, it's funny, you, you know, this probably Timothy writing, you know, a, a page a day gets, you know, with revisions gets you a novel in, you know, 18 months, you, you know, it, it's, you know, in some ways, I believe that uh, there are a lot more talented people than me, but I've been consistently sort of at this craft in a number of different genres. Now, do you have like a niche audience with 10 books? Do you have like regular readers that you know of? Uh, you know, I always consider them like the the small but mighty. I do. I do. I have a handful. Um, it, they're different for poetry than fiction. And I do get some good feedback in the early days with with some of these readers. Um, yes, it, it, and it's a nice to have, and you try not to abuse the privilege too much. So the voice that you are reading in tonight is, seemed to be, according to Robert, a stream of consciousness. And why do you choose that style than traditional narrative dialogue? Um, I think the first chapter You know, I wanted to inhabit this character. I mostly write in third person. I believe this is the only novel I've written in first person. And maybe it was a subject matter that just made me want to, to kind of go there uh, because I felt like I could inhabit this character. I, I had enough in common and I wanted to really be in that mind. And, you know, part of it for me was going deep and staying deep there because, you know, at some point I think the, the narrator might have a lot to handle. You know, it, it's, and it, I just wanted to stay kind of in that style. I, I do think I get less, I get more scene oriented. Uh, you know, that was a pretty lengthy kind of introduction to the character. I get more scene oriented, I think, the further, the further we get in the novel. Now, uh, the subject matter is obviously the character are military based and you start your first two books won poetry awards are the the poems you write poems from like military voice or experience or do you use poetry to kind of branch away from that um my first three books and i'm just gonna be completely honest i think uh you know and and you know sort of uh yeah the first three books i think were divided between family some experiences in the military experience for my life and social and political and, and sort of surreal things. And I think, you know, a lot of the stuff that people have resonated to have kind of been in that vein. And I've been trying to move away from that, you know, uh, the last five or six or seven years, because I feel like I've explored that, you know, it, so my last book of poetry was 
news poems, fake news poems in my, I'm having one published next year that's all, that's all sort of um, prose poems. So I think I've broken out of it. This might be the last book where I'm heavy into it. Although I am writing a sci-fi novel right now, I'm, I'm working with an editor on it. And I just, there's a character I love who's going to be in it, who's an, a, sort of an interrogator. So maybe I haven't completely given it up, but, but I, I, I am trying to pivot to sort of more broad uh, tropes. Yeah, you had a novel, The Interrogator's Notebook, and like your main character is um, basically he escapes from the POW camp where there is enhanced interrogation. Now, how much of that is really stuff that you experience and how much of it is fictionalized to make it more interesting as a book? So in in, in Shadow Dance, um, as um both both books, Terrier's Notebook and Shadow Dance, have some scenes of interrogation and and some of enhanced interrogation. Luckily, when I joined the military, um, I would we were between conflicts, and I I just did a lot of training, a lot of sort of field work, some even some CIA courses, but I never had to do it, and it heavily researched. I, I I read more books on interrogation you know, dozens and dozens and dozens. I've got a full bookshelf on it that I, I did to research, you know, sort of the story. So it's a little bit of both practical so experience and a lot of sort of research. What's the difference between interrogation and enhanced interrogation? Well, enhanced interrogation. So I'm personally I'm a big believer in the Geneva Convention and that enhanced interrogation leads to bad possibly erroneous results and it's it it's not the road that you should be going down most people you know 95 percent of all people just spill their guts and you know you and there's a number of things you can do and a number of tr sort of tricks of the trade where you can get people to to do these things but at the time uh some people thought it was a good idea to waterboard and put people in stress positions and do a, a number of other things because the situation called for it. I personally would question whether the intelligence they got was more actionable than the other way, because obviously you're going to say anything, the truth or not the truth, whatever you think is going to uh, sort of keep you from those situations. So I, I guess I'm getting my own personal view here, but that's my, my belief that it was a misguided uh, you know, sort of to do on a mass basis. Shadow Dance was released three or so months ago, but fairly recently was Dream State. And Dream State is uh, the psychological thriller. Was it was it uh, liberating for you to jump into a psychological thriller, or do you consider Shadow Dance a psychological thriller as well? You know, I, I Dream State was exciting because I pivoted recently. To because I consider it also a little bit of sci-fi or or you know and, and in some ways you know sort of a, a speculative and I think right now my passion is speculative. The last novel I wrote was speculative. The one I'm working for, with is speculative broadly, sci-fi and 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 I feel like I've I've gone full circle. When I was a kid, uh, science fiction was the the thing I loved the most. Right now, it's the thing I enjoy writing the most. I've come full circle. And, I, and I'm at the point where I'm like, I want, I just want to be working in, in the genre that I love the most. Um, and so I, so part of it's hard because, you know, a lot of us come from the literary side and there's a little bit of judgment and I've always kind of gone cross genre, but yeah, Dream State was ex uh, exciting for me. And I think probably it, it was the second speculative book I wrote. And I think it, it's helped me to pivot kind of into where my head is at right now. So going back to saying, like, I wanted to write what I feel like writing the next thing or the thing that excites me. So you had your books that you, you started out with the poetry books. How difficult was it to jump? Were you writing in other genres while you were writing the poetry and they just the books didn't get published yet? Or did you make this, this conscious decision to be like, OK, I'm going to give this novel a shot? Um, I've written in a lot of genres over time. And I, I had a run as a screenwriter as well and animated series at some other point but i always wrote short stories i probably write one two a year in between other projects yeah i publish like 30 or so have a book of short stories 
I always been writing fiction and the novels. In my early days, I just ended up having four or five books in different states, right? So, you know, the book spectrum I published in 2016, I think, I had been working on drafts for 20 years. So I, you know, so as I've always been working on long fiction, but now I've kind of pivoted. Uh, long fiction is my love. I, and for a while it was poetry. For a long while it was poetry, but now this is what gets me up. It gets me excited. To me, it's the culmination of of, of everything I've written. And I, long, I yeah, long fiction for like uh, based on attention spans these days. Long fiction used to be close to ten short stories, close to ten thousand words, and now longer fiction is like twenty five hundred or three thousand. So if you've got a really strong longer work, where would you submit something like that? Oh, you mean um, long short stories? Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's, there, there's a few venues that do it. And um, I'm not, uh, my short stories aren't particularly long, except a few of the sci-fi ones, which believe it or not, sci-fis will take longer work. The literary world, you know, it mostly cuts off at four or five. So for, the, for I have a friend, Colette, who writes a lot of long stories and she has a laundry list. And I don't know, I don't know them off the top of my head because my literary fiction doesn't tend to roll that long. Now, what's the, for your science fiction, out of anything that you've written, what is the furthest out there that you went with any of your stories or books? I think it's my first sci-fi novel, Spectrum. It's, I was talking to a friend about it now, and he said, you know, it's been a while since you published it. I don't think people quite understand, you know, maybe they'll quite get to what you were doing with gravity and cloning and, and some of the precepts. I, I turned the ideas of black and white on their heads. I, I, I felt like it was a really kind of a tricky novel and a little bit of a dangerous one for me to write where, um, you know, the, the, I guess the people who had the highest place in society were darker pig, had darker pigment skin and they had this because of something they, they did to live longer. And everything had flipped and a lot. And, and even the things of up and down, I, I played with a lot of tropes and it, it just, the whole thing is just a little bit crazy. I, I didn't know a lot about plotting and I feel like maybe it was the nicotine or I don't know what it was, but the, the plot hangs together, but it's wild. So that, that was book spectrum that I wrote. Um, I, I don't think I would write it again because you know why I'm more cognizant than ever of attention span. I've been working with an editor who's been trying to preach to me that you your job now is to keep people from putting the book down. And how do you do that? You've got to get them engaged in the opening and you've got to get them wanting to turn to the next chapter. Your job is to get them to not sleep and to, to keep going forward. And I think I'm not saying that my writings become more commercial, but I get it. My attention spans crap compared to 10 years ago. I don't know about the rest of you. So right now, I don't think I'm writing the same fiction I was writing 10 years ago. I'm more cognizant that I want to propel people. So in between your 10 books and the writing that you do, you are you work in TV and is that or movies and TV and that directing or writing screenwriting. Uh, but my question has to do with when do you have time for that? And that is such a fickle field and uh is it something that you want to tackle and be successful and make it in or like well, how do you feel no about it? i've 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 aged out of it i you know i've had four different screenwriting partners four different managers i started out of college pitching animated series that's where, where i got my sort of my first you know, thing that i optioned and and i've haven't really done it actively the last decade where i really have pivoted to 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 books and you know the reason why um, I, I now know some people who, when I have a book published or sometimes I get an idea, they help pitch it for me to screen. And the, the last screenplay I wrote was probably like eight years ago, which I did, uh, for spec. And I, I'm, I get, I think I'm done. I think I'm done. I want, because the, the book is mine. Although to be clear, what does mine mean? Well, if you have an agent, they're going to want to change it. 
if you're working with an editor like I am now, I, I, I have one that I love, they're going to want to change it. The publisher, not so much small presses, but the large, large sort of the better the, the publisher, the more changes they want. So I just think I have more control. And I hate to say it this way, like once you have sort of the, I, I hate to talk in these terms, like the IP or the idea, I don't really care. Like if someone wants to have it show up on screen, that's not where my head's at anymore. Like it's not, it's not something I want to do. I, I want to live in this fiction world. I want to live in my bubble if I can. So say that someone makes you an offer, right? Your, your latest novel here, um, someone does everything for you. Someone takes the option, someone produces it. It's ready to roll, but they really, you've lost totally control of the subject matter, the plot of the book. Would you give it the green light? Or at this point, you'd be like, you know what? No. I, I have actually a good story for that. Sure. So my first book, an interrogator's notebook, I did a non-traditional publishing thing where one of my people who uh, was working on one of my screenplays said, hey, I've got this press. Let's get it. I didn't even go out to agents. Let's 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 get it out there and I'll pitch it to screen. And the whole thing just I, I got a pretty well-known writer director to attach and he wrote the uh, pilot for it. I, I got a paradigm and agency attached. I got um yeah, Skydance TV in their first early on um, uh, attached and, and and we did the whole circuit, right? Where we pitched the thing, but this pitch was not my book. I helped Todd, who was the guy who, who, who would play the, the, the role of showrunner. He took it into a much more serial progression into a much more sort of 24 type of progression and did changes and I and I gave feedback on new characters, but it was all outside my hands. Here's what I liked. I got to weigh in. I, I and and so it wasn't quite mine when it was getting pitched already, even though I, I got to, to read everything and I got to give my feedback. I would think I'd be mostly okay unless it was completely unethical to something I didn't believe. Um, they, they he made this character sufficiently uh, self destructive for me to be okay with what he was doing. All right, well, it was a pleasure talking to you. And uh, yeah, if you want to, folks want to find out more about Martin, oh, actually, that's that's the wrong one. Um, hang on a second, I thought I had it all set up, I was all. Oh, oh so and by the way, I appreciate those that that, that um, hung here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yes. Anyway, um, I'm just having a I'm having a screen share nightmare here. But uh, the your website is martinotrider.com. So if you want to find out more about Martin, check that out and uh, check out his books. Uh, especially the new one. The new one is great. And I appreciate you and I appreciate you being here. Uh, thanks. I appreciate everyone jumping on on a weeknight. Um, thank you. All right. And for folks that are watching the live stream, you want to come in and read something on the open mic, uh, just use the link and uh, it's opened up for you. And uh, I'll let you in. And uh, thanks again, Martin. And uh, hopefully we'll run into each other again. I hope so. It's been a pleasure.